Welcome to the modern revolution, comrades. As of the recording of this video, the clashes between protesters and the police over the murder of George Floyd and so many other black lives at the hands of those in blue have been raging on for 40 days straight. It should be clear to even those who aren't politically engaged and or knowledgeable that this societal upheaval, this movement for justice is one of historic proportions. Whether you've been on the ground putting your body and life on the line for your comrades, using the power of social media, YouTube, and other platforms to educate and spread awareness of the significance of the protests, or watching from the sidelines, you are a part of history. And what we're all witnessing with our very own eyes will someday be something spoken of in history classes and lectures. It's been so surreal for me, but also incredibly empowering as a member of a marginalized community. Seeing thousands upon thousands of people from every single corner of society risk life and limb so that the black community, trans community, indigenous community, and every single marginalized community can have a voice and a fighting chance has been life-changing. But being a part of the actual protests, witnessing police brutality with my own own eyes, being tear gassed, listening to and taking in the words of black and indigenous speakers, shaking their hands and standing side by side with them, and realizing that we truly are in this fight together, that we are all part of one beautiful community, and that no one person can be free until every single person is free. To say these revelations have completely changed the course of my own activism would be nothing short of an understatement. And what I want to do with this video in the spirit of things is shift gears a bit. You could already tell by the new backdrop. <laughs> and instead of doing my usual deep dive into all things philosophical, sociological, and political, use the wisdom and revolutionary energy I've gained through these experiences to teach you, in a somewhat structured manner, the basics of certain political concepts and figures. So like a college lecture, but actually fun, hopefully. <laughs> We're already on the subject, so for today, let's chat about protesting 101. Now, obviously, no one person could ever cover every single thing that there is to know about the ins and outs of protesting, but I've compiled a sizable chunk of information that we will go through at a good click. And I want to ensure that by the time you have finished watching, that you will understand more why people like myself do what we do. And if you have the spoons to do so, feel prepared to put your own boots to the ground and join us in this fight. The most American thing you can do is protest and dissent. I've left timestamps in the description if there's a specific section you want to jump to, as well as a host of links to various legal and activist organizations that everyone should know about and share widely. But I don't want to waste any more of your time, so let's kick things off by talking about general protest etiquettes. Arguably the most important thing to keep in mind while in a protest situation is how to act in a crowd. I can speak from firsthand experience that protests can be an incredibly tense experience and you will feel that in the air. Be mindful of how you're moving and how you're coming across to others. People will be keeping their eyes out for agent provocateurs and antagonizers, so do all you can to dress in a way that allows you to blend in with the crowd and make sure you aren't wearing anything that would cause others to misjudge why you're there. Plain clothing with a mask is usually the best aesthetic unless you're joining others in black block. Anonymity is incredibly important due to the use of surveillance tech by police and the fact that your identity is not what matters here. The larger the crowd, the more power you possess, and it's that power that supplies the push needed to make true, long-lasting, systemic change happen. And speaking of crowds, if you can help it, always go with a group. Going by yourself puts you at tremendous risk of arrest and or physical harm due to the unpredictable nature of protests. And having a group of trusted friends not only gives more protection to the group as a whole, but you'll be able to coordinate strategies for certain situations, escape routes, and be able to get in contact more quickly with legal organizations if one or more of you are arrested. If you can, leave your phone at home and 
make sure only one of you has a phone that they can use for emergency contacts. If you must have a phone on you for reporting and or documenting purposes, keep it on airplane mode whenever not in use and don't let it take away from your awareness of your surroundings. Which gets us into OPSEC or Operations Security, which is a process of identifying critical information, identifying a threat, assessing vulnerabilities, analyzing the risk, and applying countermeasures. Essentially, always have your eyes up, scan your horizons, watch intersections as you cross them for police movements, and have a full awareness of what's happening around you at all times. Imagine a shooting target and start at the center. That inner circle is the area of things closest to you, and the other circles symbolize areas that are further and further away from you. Threats closer to that inner circle are more dangerous to you than ones that are further out outside. So using that method will allow you to compartmentalize information and better assess what decisions to make in any given situation. Lastly, only do what you feel you have the ability to do. For example, I'm autistic and struggle with anxiety, but I'm able-bodied and feel comfortable being in the middle of protest situations. Not everyone will be able to do this and that's fine. Your safety and well-being are of the utmost importance, so going to a safer event might be good for those with PTSD and other forms of trauma, and social media is an excellent method for sharing information and those who are unable to be on the grounds. With those basics out of the way, let's dive into the second chunk of this video and discuss working with organizations. Always do your research and learn what the backgrounds are of certain organizations, what types of activism they do, and how they go about doing it, why they're making certain demands, and if they plan on following through. If it feels like they have ulterior motives, guess what? They probably do. They shouldn't be trusted merely because they exist. We've seen groups like Rose City Justice in Portland steer the narrative away from truly radical black and indigenous voices and use woke liberal ideals of peaceful protesting and respectability politics to pacify protesters, work with police, and make money for themselves. Don't trust a single one of them. If they aren't being run by black and indigenous voices, you have every right to see them as suspects. There must be unified messaging and unified motives for these groups to be successful. Just as people like myself don't want to see cops marching at Pride, we do not want to see former cops in these organizations. I've already heard questions like, well, they left the force and they're now giving you their aid. Why would you reject that? If you knew why we don't want cops at Pride, you'd know why we don't want them in these spaces either. As a good friend put it, once a cop, always a cop. Also important to consider is what sort of structure the organizations and the event they're carrying out have. If they're planning marches, where are the marches going? What is the purpose of that particular march or protest? What will happen when they reach their destination? And what are the goals and intended outcomes? Everything should be in service of the community and not for clout. The protesters in Hong Kong taught us an invaluable lesson. Do not trust anyone who labels themselves as a protest leader. Leaders are targets of the state which will endanger every single person they're around while on the flip side autonomy or the act of being self-directed and self-governed is the driving force behind these protests. Collective direct Action is what gets things done, and hierarchies so often serve as nothing more than a barrier to our goals. In order for any goals to be reached in the first place, however, do all you can to protect the safety and health of yourself and others. Some key items that every protester should have on them before heading into the fray are a first aid kit, or street medic kit if you're going as a medic instead of merely as a protester, bottles of water, as many as they can carry in a backpack, power bar, eye protection, and tear-free shampoo, as well as saline spray and backup masks in case of contamination by tear gas. Also, if you need to take any medicine with you, keep it all in one bottle so it's easier to find. Other assorted things like menstrual pads, wet wipes, and tissues, enough money for food and transportation, as well as fresh clothes in a bag of some sort, comfortable running shoes, a thicker mask to protect yourself from chemical agents, and any and all essentials you can think of are a must. Don't wear any 
any loose jewelry or hair, since you'll be in close proximity with others who could at any moment run or jump past you due to attacks by the police, and opt for wearing glasses instead of contacts in the case of smoke, dust, or tear gas. Extra phone chargers and electrolytes will also be two of your best friends. Gloves, especially those made for car repairs or even oven mitts, are perfect for picking up hot smoke canisters, and if you're able to, weather permitting, wear double layers of clothing in case the outside layer gets contaminated by tear gas. Injuries, heat stroke, shock, etc. are all common occurrences, so learning enough first aid to assist anyone suffering from those aforementioned things, or even being aware of the signs of mental distress in yourself and others, can be life-saving and prevent any traumatic experiences from developing into PTSD. Lastly, do not spread information if it hasn't been verified. Rumors can spread fear and division through a crowd in the blink of an eye and cause those around you to panic or make rash decisions, leading to potential injury and arrests. Take everything with a grain of salt and don't let yourself be panicked either. Speaking of keep calm and don't panic, let's talk about something that I myself am a little more familiar with. The Black Block. Aaron from the channel Reeducation made an excellent guide on what Black Block is, which I will link above, and I'll give a basic summary of what he said here. Black Block itself is not the name of a unit, but describes the aesthetic worn by certain individuals from various anti-fascist, socialist, and communist groups in a protest situation. If you are in Block. You'll be dressed up in black from head to toe, with a hoodie, face protection that shields you from pepper spray, and thicker combat or hiking boots. Think of it as protective armor from whatever the police or white nationalists try to throw at you. Because those in block tend to form the front lines between cops and ordinary protesters, they will rubber bullets, tear gas canisters, and other riot control munitions fired directly at them. Heavy gloves, gas masks, and even literal body armor will be necessary for the protection of themselves and those they're protecting, which is the key of the block. Defense, not offense. Because everyone in block looks the same, it creates this mass of unidentifiable people in which no one person can be singled out by the police, and the sight of it can be an effective intimidation tactic. The media narrative is going to be against you no matter what, so staying in formation, being a mindful organizer, communicating constantly, and employing various tactics are critical. You must have a keen knowledge of your city's layouts, know where the best escape routes are, be willing to listen to those who have more experience dealing with the police and prepare as much as you possibly can for any situation that could arise. Those in block are very much operating in a militaristic fashion and using the police's strategies against them. And one of the most effective ways to do so is with the formation of a phalanx, or a protective wall of multiple lines of those in block between the police and protesters, as they dig their heels in and use whatever they have at their disposal for shields or protective equipment, they can block off the advancement of police squads, give protesters time to move from one area to the next, or even swoop in and save someone from being detained by police, also known as an unarrest. Something those in block and ordinary protesters all need to know is what to do if you are tear gassed. Tear gas is a chemical weapon, also known as CS gas, that is still employed by law enforcement in this country despite its being banned by the Geneva Convention and countries around the world. It's a weapon of war and it should be treated as such. If you believe you'll be in a situation where chemical agents will be used, avoid the use of oil-based sunscreen or lotions because creams will absorb said agents and prolong their effects. Gas masks or at the very least swim goggles that wrap all the way around and masks with replaceable filters will be effective at keeping droplets out of your airways and away from your eyes. Should you be exposed to tear gas, do not rub it in. Call for a medic if there are any nearby, get out of the area into safer grounds, remove contaminated articles of clothing like your mask, and do everything you can to stay calm. Panic attacks can worsen the irritation in your throat and your lungs like I experienced firsthand a month ago, causing a more severe cough and more difficulty with breathing. So having a friend or partner there as a comforting presence will expedite 
the healing process. Blow your nose, rinse your mouth out, and cough and spit, but try to avoid swallowing to keep any droplets from entering your stomach and take slow, deep breaths of fresh air so your lungs can relax and your muscles can loosen up a bit. I'm sure most of us have heard that washing your eyes out with milk will do the trick, but it's actually more effective for exposure to pepper spray and won't do much to ease the pain and irritation from tear gas. Thankfully, the best method of cleansing your eyes is by using three teaspoons of baking soda with eight ounces of water. The super simple combination will break down the tear gas chemical and as long as you use clean drinkable water in rinse your eyes as needed, you'll be good to go in no time. Don't ever say Mother Alice didn't do anything for ya. And lastly, because tear gas droplets tend to cling to whatever surface they touch, change out of your clothes the moment you're home and thoroughly wash your body to prevent any further exposure. Since we're on the topic of exposure, let's chat a bit about documenting the protests. It is good and necessary to document police brutality and balance that with peaceful moments from protesters to effectively counteract the narrative from the media that will side with the police over you. You have a constitutional First Amendment right to film the police and every bit of footage you capture could be necessary for your defense and the defense of others. But remember, if you only shoot that which involves conflict, you're only feeding the media narrative and you are not a journalist of true integrity. The footage must speak for itself and it must speak the truth. You must neutralize all internal biases in your work. For example, if you see someone on the ground who's clearly distraught, practice sensitivity and don't take advantage of them for your own photo op. With great power comes... <laughs> You know. <laughs> to get the best footage, hold your phone horizontally in order to get more information on screen at once and sit your elbows over your hips so it forms a tripod and gives more stability to the footage. While panning, think like a cinematographer and do it slowly so the viewer has a clear understanding of what's happening. Capturing well-known visual landmarks, street signs, anything with the time and date will prove the legitimacy of the footage, thus giving credence to what you shot, thus potentially overriding the narrative that's been constructed by the media and police, which is huge. And another way to communicate information to your viewers is to talk about what it is you're seeing. What weapons do the police have? How many of them are there? Are they working with different agencies such as the Department of Homeland Security, the National Guard, the feds, etc.? Are they holding their weapons? Do they have protective gear? Do they have riot control munitions? Are they using hateful verbal language or body language like the cop in Portland who has spotted flashing a white power sign to a white nationalist? Doing all of this means being in close proximity with the police, however, and whether or not you're interfering is at the discretion of the officer or officers near you. Be mindful of that and keep an arm's length or more away if you can. If you take pictures of those around you, ask for permission first, and do your best to blur out faces in any identifiable characteristics such as tattoos, specific logos, or even distinct hairstyles. I'll link a blurring tool here that is easy to use, and something every protester should have in their toolkits. Anything that could reveal their identity to the police needs to be removed, and the focus should be on the police rather than the protesters, so practice caution at all times. Also, don't ever tag yourself in photos on social media. Don't post pics of the protests if you can help it and try to scrub anything that could be used by investigative agencies to connect you or anyone else to any particular time and place. One last note for our white allies. If you're shooting in certain situations that black people might not be able to, that's white privilege. Be aware of that. Up to this point, we've talked quite a bit about how to protect yourself while in the presence of police, but what happens if you're actually arrested? There's not enough time in one video to go over the rights we all possess as protesters, so I will link an article from the ACLU about basic rights in the description that I would encourage all of you to go and check out. The police are a domestic terrorist organization who will utilize every tool at their disposal to arrest and incarcerate you. Do not underestimate them and take every single encounter counter with them seriously. To take some wisdom from a zine that my roommate put together, police have been trained to initiate a program of violence in order to force compliance. Portland police have used tactics like kneeling in front of a crowd in order to pacify them. Don't ever 
fall for it. Not even hours later, they were once again tear gassing and shooting us with rubber bullets and mercilessly attacking those who were doing nothing more than raising their voices against injustice. Study their tactics and know how to respond in scenarios when they bore rush a crowd, kettle off an area, or use blind corners to their advantage. If you can maneuver around them, you can outsmart them. Stay on your toes and don't allow yourself to stay static in any one particular area. At the same time, if you and others are able to relay information about police whereabouts and movement, this will allow for greater communication amongst protesters and allow the crowd to be more prepared to fight back in whatever way is necessary. But you have to be aware of more than what's immediately outside of you and the crowd you're in. The New York Police Department and other police departments across the country have deployed undercover cops into crowds of protesters in order to sow division amongst them, incite violence, and give the police any excuse to commit yet another war crime and strengthen the media's narrative against us. When you hear Trump and conservatives labeling us as terrorists, this is part of what fuels it. Actual terrorists calling us terrorists because they invaded our crowds to deceive and manipulate us. Typical. Keep an eye out for any cuffs in their pockets, wires, or anything near their ear, identifiable armbands or wristbands, what looks like a bulletproof vest under their shirt, or any sort of behavior that seems out of place or suspicious. A combination of knowing your city, being aware of surveillance tech like stingrays and police cameras, staying on top of where certain groups of police and protesters are at all times, constantly scanning your surroundings like we mentioned earlier, looking out for agent provocateurs, and refraining from intentionally putting yourself in an exceptionally dangerous situation will do wonders in preventing you from being seriously hurt. But even with this knowledge and these tactics at your fingertips, we are all at a high risk of arrest simply for putting ourselves out there, and people of color especially will be targeted at disproportionately high rates. Should you spot police approaching a person of color in a protest situation, or in general, stay a safe distance away. But make sure the officer knows that you are watching and recording everything that is happening. Record the entire interaction and be sure to check on the person being arrested to see if they're alright, if they've been hurt, and if they feel their rights have been violated. Do not leave until the police and or person are gone. Now, if the tables turn and the police take you into custody, stay calm and don't do anything that comes across as you resisting. Don't yell, run, fight, or give them an excuse to pile more charges on top of you. Because believe you me, they will happily do it. Don't say a word to them. Regardless of what they ask you, don't give any accounts of what happens and only open your mouth to request a lawyer. The National Lawyers Guild and jail support are excellent resources for this. Until you've been given one, don't sign anything, don't give a false ID, ask for badge numbers or the names of officers around you, and ask them why you're being arrested. They're required to give you an answer, and their response can be used in your legal defense. Defending legal rights is praxis, after all. <laughs> and part of police procedure is doing a pat-down of potential suspects, so avoid having any type of weapon if you can. If they find a knife, they will call it a weapon instead of a tool and use that as another excuse to keep you detained. Also, you never have to consent to a search of yourself or your belongings even though this doesn't apply to the pat-down itself. If the officer does anything abusive to you or those around you, report them as soon as you are able to. They will more than likely ask for your phone, so be sure to disable the touch and face IDs, log out of all of your current social media accounts, and change your passwords, encrypt everything you can, and do not give them access to any sort of personal information. Apps like Signal, WhatsApp, Telegram are perfect for encrypted messaging, and Bitwarden is a fantastic password manager should you need one. This is not because they sponsored me, even though I would not turn that down. <laughs>
Once you're released from prison, contact organizations like the Minnesota Freedom Fund, National Lawyers Guild, your local ACLU chapter, and legal support hotlines as soon as possible to ensure that you are taken care of and protected from the police's absolutely brutal treatment of protesters due to them seeing us as dissenters and a threat to society. Why do y'all think they've been given militaristic power over us? But as much power as they wield over us, never forget that we the people are the ones with the most power in the end, so long as we are doing this for the right reasons. Without the proper motives and without having our hearts in the right place, we will be nothing but a barrier to progress. Recognize the role that privilege plays in these protests and the dynamics it can create. What we've seen here in Portland is a significant number of white activists pulling these protests away from their original purpose, as well as diluting the influence of black and indigenous activists who have already dealt with decades of racism, gentrification, and the inability to have their voices heard. If you are white and you genuinely want to be a part of this movement, to be a part of history, you must ensure that you are boosting and supporting their voices and not overpowering them. Walk with them, but not in front of them. This is a struggle for black and trans liberation, and we are here to give whatever aid we can. Do all you can to avoid coming across as the white savior type. We are not the guiding light for black people because they already know damn well what it is they need, and they have every right to feel uncomfortable at the sight of streets full of white activists and none of their own. Imagine all the oppression they've suffered through, only to be scolded by white leftists and activists for not wanting their help. If you truly want to help, let these people express their anger, shut your mouth, and listen to them. Kamazots, a comrade from Twitch, put it perfectly whenever he said, we need to be in the community as a support structure rather than a dominating or invasive force. You are not there to spread your personal ideology, but to help them recognize they are being ignored and delegitimized even by people in the crowds of white protesters. Also, this shouldn't have to be said, but don't fucking protest for Instagram likes. This is not for your own personal gain. If clout is what you want, don't even come in the first place. Influencers have already ruined so much. Please do not ruin this too. Be present. Be a part of history. Use whatever ability you have to move this cause forward. We cannot succeed unless we are all standing together in solidarity and willing to work together as one unified community. We are the vanguard. We are the force that can topple the system, but none of it will succeed if we aren't willing to lift up the marginalized and the vulnerable and risk everything to give them a chance at justice. And with that, I'm calling it a wrap on this expedition through the ins and outs of protesting. You are now prepared to step into the role of the modern revolutionary and join us in the movement for the liberation of all peoples. Be safe, be smart, take what you've learned and use it for good. And never forget, we are all in this together. Now, there's only one thing left to do.